to Inside Look, a segment here on Inside Ambition where we take a deep dive into something that's happening at or around Drexel. I'm Alexandra George. Happy New Year and Happy New Quarter and Happy New Season of our show. We have a brand new YouTube channel now, so make sure you hit that subscribe button and like this video. If you like what we're doing here at Inside Ambition, please share our channel with any Drexel students you may know. It's hard to believe that this January marks the fourth quarter of virtual courses here at Drexel. But fourth time's the charm? Colleges and universities all over the country have enlisted the help of task forces and health experts to bring students back to campus safely in 2021. And as much as we like to think we are special here at Drexel with co-op and the quarter system and a 10 out of 10 Woodbang mascot, Drexel University is no different than any other school with this hope in mind. But of course, there have been a few hiccups in this pursuit. Nothing sticking your head upside down and holding your mouth and nose shut for 20 to 30 minutes can't fix though. With one in a thousand Americans dead from COVID and cases skyrocketing across the country, it makes sense that most schools have opted to stay virtual some of which have even canceled the rest of in-person courses for the year. Other universities brought back things like in-person housing and dining this past fall, but have decided to suspend them for the spring semester. And I'm sure, as you are well aware, though classes will remain virtual here at Drexel for now, drumroll please. <laughs> Drexel is reopening housing for the first time since March. Woohoo! I think. So what does this mean for the incoming residents? What about first year students? With no roommates or lounges to interact in, how are they going to establish roots here at Drexel? And what about the RAs? Is the university doing enough to support them? Now let's take an inside look. President Fry announced on Monday, December 21st, that winter term move-in and face-to-face -face classes would be delayed. RAs moved in on January 2nd, and all other residents are set to move in throughout the week of the 16th. So is this a good thing? A bad thing? Should it be happening? Will it actually happen? Let us know what you think in the comments below. I mean, you know what they say, res hall openings, can't wait. In Fry's most recent message to the Drexel community, he emphasized how important it is for us all to remain flexible. I don't know about you, but considering how flexible I've been since March, I should be able to do the splits by now. With the state of the pandemic and our own institution's future constantly in flux, many students are being asked to reevaluate their plans for return. Not to mention, there is still no guarantee of housing for anyone at this point, even after people have moved back in. Drexel could decide to close the halls at any moment based on their own reasoning or because of city guidelines. Couple of things here that are important to note. One, students will receive an adjustment on their e-bill by the end of January for their housing and dining charges to reflect the change in the calendar. Yay money! Two. During the remote learning period starting today, January 11th, students are strongly discouraged from returning to campus or participating in any group gatherings. I see you, bro. I know you got a cute fit over the holidays that you want to flaunt in front of all your friends, but don't do it. And three, it's been a solid nine months since I have had that delectable cuisine from the Wawa at 34th and Market. I know that's not really like important information, I just wanted someone to know. If you're watching this, please bring me a grilled cheese and a mint Oreo shake ASAP. And wow, I mean, can I just say, what a plot twist that the reopening plan evolved only a week and a half after its initial release. I truly did not see this coming. I feel like usually Miss Coronavirus is like super chill. She's always really forgiving and totally predictable. She gives us plenty of time in advance to figure these things out, right? One student demographic that has struggled through the unpredictability of housing since the start of the pandemic are the RAs. 
Positions were offered in the fall and then revoked, and many feared that the same would happen this winter. If you don't know what an RA is, you're probably a transfer student or a commuter. Or maybe your RA was just busy cramming for the MCATs or just got into a new relationship your first year. An RA or a resident assistant facilitates the social, academic, and personal growth of students in res halls. According to a message from Housing and Residence Life, along with a small monthly stipend, RAs also receive free room and board for their work. Other than ratting you out when you make the entire building smell like the devil's lettuce, or telling you to quiet down once it passes 10 p.m. on a school night, RAs do a lot of work. This past quarter, there were about 50 residents living on campus between Race and Styles Hall, with a staff of about 10 RAs to support them. These RAs had a lot to report from their experience, and it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, or hugs and kisses, or crowded spaces and indoor dining. I don't know, whatever makes you happy these days. They cited issues including maintenance workers not wearing masks, increased expectations for shifts at the front desk, and being left out of the loop when a resident had tested positive or was quarantining because of COVID-19. In anticipation of the reopening of all res halls, this winter returning RAs put together a list of demands for HRL and Drexel administration ahead of Fry's latest email. The demands were in reference to the following, accessible testing, personal protective equipment, contact tracing, hazard pay, housing guarantee, accountability for all, and support for HRL professional staff. Not only were RAs uniquely affected by the timely decision to close university housing due to the pandemic, but they are now responsible for reopening university housing safely and making sure that first year students have a sense of community on their floors, which isn't gonna be easy. As many of you know, according to phila.gov, Philadelphia County is currently regarded as a high risk transmission community with guidelines in the city. They've only tightened over recent months. Housing and Residence Life or HRL has implemented a strict no guest policy for the winter quarter, as well as mass mandates. And they've made all room singles in traditional dorms. All lounges will be locked and communal spaces like kitchens will be limited to one person at a time. I can't say I'd be upset by a one person at a time bathroom restriction though, and have all eight stalls to myself. I can't be the only one whose dream it is to plank across all of the stalls. Come on. Additionally, Drexel has now instituted a COVID-19 testing plan in order to address safety concerns. According to President Fry, students and phase one through four employees will undergo baseline COVID testing at the start of the term. Students will then be asked to quarantine until they receive their negative test results and meals will be provided as they wait. Nothing like that good urban grub. As of this taping, all residents in Drexel res halls and ACC housing will be tested weekly. If residents refuse to comply, they will face conduct consequences and lose access to their buildings. So unless you wanna be sleeping on the sidewalk, you better make sure you're getting tested regularly. Students not included in the required testing program will still be able to schedule a COVID-19 test at Drexel on a voluntary basis. Everyone on campus will also be required to check into the Drexel Health Tracker app daily to log their symptoms. Drexel has a comprehensive contact tracing plan in place, so it is crucial that everyone comply to avoid an outbreak. I know the Drexel Health Tracker has a bad rep, but we gotta do what we gotta do in a global pandemic. And I mean, they could have made the app like Among Us style, and if you're an imposter, it means you have COVID. Um, or you're showing symptoms, that would be pretty cool. And come on y'all, this is a perfect opportunity. I mean, we all know that we're better than Temple, but since we can't kick their little owl behinds in a football game, let's show them up by properly enacting COVID restrictions and keeping everyone on campus and the surrounding community safe. That'll show them.
According to Dr. Janet Cruz, Director of Student Health Services here at Drexel, the majority of people in our general demographic, you know, young adults, college age with crippling anxiety and imposter syndrome, most of us have been symptomatic after infected by COVID. Studies show that you are contagious up to two days before you even start showing symptoms. So even if you think you're healthy, it's really, really important to always be following social distancing guidelines, washing your hands and wearing a mask. There were surges on campus after the most recent holidays with cases at 3.5% after Halloween and 4% after Thanksgiving. Hopefully y'all were smart over winter break. Wait, who am I kidding? I know people weren't smart over winter break. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Veronica. I saw your Instagram pictures. I am sure that you're tired of hearing the rhetoric about how important it is to protect the surrounding community. I mean, it hasn't exactly gotten through to most people. And you're probably not worried about the death rate or the symptoms for our demographic either. But COVID still affects us, every single one of us. Just think about it. The incoming first year students, RAs and so many others who depend on Drexel housing. Not to mention the people who rely on their jobs in the restaurant and retail industries to survive. Just think about all the opportunities you missed out on this past quarter and the others prior. Think about how you would be living your best life, your college years seen COVID. Okay, now quit lying to yourself. It wouldn't have been that amazing. You probably would have canceled half those plans anyways, but it still would have been better. And now that we have a vaccine, there is an end in sight, but that doesn't mean this is anywhere close to over. The journey will be a lot easier if we all look out for each other and everyone follows the mandates appropriately. Okay, that's my two cents. Now we all wanna hear from you. Do RAs deserve better treatment and greater stability for all they provide the university? Should Drexel have even reopened housing? How long do you think this is gonna last? Sound off in the comments below. And as always, to stay up to date with all of our content, make sure to follow our Instagram at inside underscore ambition and subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Hi, welcome to Inside Ambition, my bedroom, and the very first episode. I'm your host, Lizzie Friedman, and here we'll be talking all about arts and entertainment in and around Drexel University. This week, we'll be diving right into the theater world. With the in-person nature of live theater, it poses many questions on how it can still be created in a virtual world. Luckily, theater makers are inherently creative creatures and are always coming up with new solutions to create and view theater during COVID-19. After a brief standstill right at the beginning of the pandemic, theaters were able to get back up and running in new ways than ever before. Philadelphia's own Wilma Theatre Company released a production entitled Code Blue, which is described by the Philadelphia Inquirer as a 13-minute iPhone drama. The entire play was created in these actors' respective homes and shot right on their phones. And adults say we're obsessed with our phones. Even the Philadelphia Theatre Company, after the halt of their April 2020 production of The Wolves, shifted to create a virtual staging of the same play. Granted, all of the actors were in their homes and not on a stage, so I guess a virtual homing? No, no, that doesn't work. Anyway, even the Art and Theater Company located in Old City is releasing filmed archived productions of their past shows for audiences to enjoy from the comfort of their own homes it's like Netflix, but for Philly theater. Even our very own Drexel Co-op Theater Company has shifted to a fully virtual platform where anyone can enjoy the work of the advanced improv class, the musical theater cabaret class, the Newark's festivals, and even the main stage productions right on YouTube. And they're up there forever and ever.
To talk further with us about theater at Drexel, I'm so happy to have the director of that very program here with me um, today. It's Nick Anselmo. Hey, Nick, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for being here and agreeing to be my guinea pig on my very first episode. Happy to do it. Yeah, thank you. So, of course, a lot has, has had to change with live theater because of COVID. Um, how has the theater department, you know, adapted and is continuing to adapt with these crazy times? Yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, um, in the spring, we were kind of excited by the challenge of, you know, switching to purely online delivery. And, um, and you know, sort of, I, I've said this a number of times that we actors have to live in the given circumstances. And, uh, and I think the given circumstances are like, well, we can't have a live audience and we have to do this digitally. So let's embrace it and let's make the most out of it. So I think we've done a lot of really clever things. We, all the advanced improv shows are going, are online, which is really great because anybody can watch them anywhere. Um, we've had a number of guest artists um, visit the improv show, which is really cool. Yeah, and then being able to put the musical theater cabarets online and, and then this fall with the Mantua Theater Project. So putting 10 short plays written by seven to 12 year olds um, online as separate episodes like was really incredible and really fun and then certainly you know coming up in the winter all these great promos I'm doing um, <laughs> in the winter is essential which you know is a great collection of monologues written by students from interviews of people who have been determined to be essential workers which and again it will live forever online and so anybody can watch it from anywhere in the world at any time I think that's exciting yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. I think that this accessibility in theater is really amazing. Like what's come out of all of this is it's really great. Definitely. Yeah, we got to count our blessings right now. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there. yes, find a way. I mean, it doesn't replace things, but find a way to make it work. Yeah, right. Definitely. So as an arts educator, why do you think it's important for students and literally everyone to be continuing to interact with theater and the arts in general during these pretty troubling times. Yeah, well, I mean, the arts are even more important, I think, today than they've ever been. And, you know, I'm, I'm partial, obviously, to theater. Um, and, and you know, you know this about me, but sort of more and more lately, I've been about, like, this idea of applied theater. Like, what do we do with the skills we learn in theater and how do we use them in everyday life? And the more we are distant from each other, the more we are um, disconnected from each other, the more we need the idea of like theater to help us connect and learn how to be human beings and learn how what life is like for other people and and especially to learn empathy, you know, like to really empathize with other people's plights, you know, like you know someone who's struggling. Um, I I think that when you aren't aware of what people are going through and when you don't have that empathy, it's really hard to, to understand, you know, how people struggle and what they need. And so theater really teaches that because it teaches us how to really connect as human beings, how to really listen. Even if we're in a digital world, I feel like I'm connected to you right now because, I mean, that's what I've trained my whole life to do, to, to be vulnerable, to be open, and to unfortunately probably show everything I'm feeling all the time <laughs> but but you know that's what we do in theater and I think the arts just really help us to have that and continue to have the connection and be productive human beings in, in the world. I think that's a really beautiful way of looking at it yeah I really like that that response um, yeah so I know we touched on it a little you touched on it a little bit earlier but this fall, the theater company was able to produce a fully virtual production of short plays written by young students, which of course you directed. And of course, I played a mermaid that magically transforms into a fairy and then back into a mermaid, very Freaky Friday style. <laughs> and I know that you run the Mantua Theater Project, which allows students to write their own plays and get to see them fully produced by real adult actors um, every year. You've been doing this for like the past decade, right? Um, yeah, so can you tell us like what that's like for these kids to try their hand in playwriting and the benefits for it for them? Yeah, uh, it's such an uh, amazing program. And actually I, I have been doing it for two decades more oh, or more. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, really like it was one of the things that sort of got me into teaching that 
under seeing how being successful at theater could really just open someone up and lift them up. Um, young people, slightly older young people like yourself, <laughs> um, and even really adults, you know, like sort of the really uh, giving them experiences of success is a wonderful thing. And so, I mean, if you watch the video, and I, I think you were there when we were sh when we were watching the one video, and Maya Williams, who's a seven year old. Uh, after we watched her show, we went to Maya and we talked to her a little bit and she just lit up like this little girl had an experience that she's not going to forget very soon. And hopefully the next time she's feeling kind of down about herself, that experience will help her to go like, yeah, but things can be better, you know, and things can be better. So, like, I, I think it's an amazing program and it really isn't about teaching anybody to be an artist or a playwright or a, an actor or a director. It's just about making them, helping them have a really successful experience and and having an audience love it and having a group of strangers see it and laugh and applaud and celebrate you. Um, and I think we all love to be celebrated. So it's it's an incredible program. It's been around for 20, over 25 years, 30 years. Oh my gosh, it's gotta be at least 30 years in New York now. Um, and I ran the program in Trenton uh, going all the way back to the year 2000. Wow. I could have been in the program. <laughs> you could have. <laughs> if only. Um, well, I kind of was, a little bit. <laughs> I was helping out. <laughs> anyone can, as you said earlier, anyone can watch this this festival now. The whole thing is up on the Drexel Co-op Theater Company's YouTube page, right? Yes. Yeah, anybody can watch. There are 10 short episodes, and they can watch all the other great stuff that we've done uh, on that YouTube channel. Yeah, so that means that everyone can see me as Coral the Mermaid slash Luna the Fairy in the comfort of their own home. Right, flying through the air. Exactly, <laughs> right in my living room. <laughs> so working in the industry as long as you have, what was it like directing a show fully virtually? Is there any aspects of it that you'd like to keep in when, we're, when it's safe enough to go back to live theater? Oh, that's so interesting. Um, I mean, it was a little terrifying, but I always love a good challenge. And so like, especially diving in with no sense of what I was doing um, was really fascinating. And, and I had done some film, but not as a director, just as an actor. So I don't know if I would take any of it into the theater world um, because it was really like, as I started to learn so much about just the image, so much about like, you know, playing with the edge of the image or this this box that you see right here now, um, how we could be in and out of it and what that said and how that was funny. Um, and that won't translate it all live and it shouldn't. Like you don't, you don't have that patience to have that simplicity. But I have seen some really interesting work. Last spring when we did the cabaret, a lot of the performances were really so honest and so simple and real and it was because you know, everything was here, everything was small and specific. And that was nice. It was, a, I think it's a nice way to learn. I think you can always make things bigger, but I think it's harder to make them honest and real and small. And so I think that was a great learning tool for a lot of people. All right, so I have one last question for you. Okay. And you said earlier, but I know that you are from Chicago. Yeah. Um, would you care to make a defense for deep dish pizza? Ah, is does is there a defense needed? I mean, it is the most amazing pizza there is. <laughs> so, you can't say that. <laughs> but so no, pizza is such a religion in Chicago that um, you have heard me say this. I know because I I don't eat pizza anywhere else other than Chicago. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Nick, for joining me today. I really look forward to what else the theater department has in store for us this, this year, which is a lot. And um, of course, it will always be reported right here on Inside Ambition. It was so nice chatting with you through the Zoomiverse. I hope you stay well. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey Dragons, it's Paige here with your weekly Thunder Index, where we discuss all things science, storms, stars, and sustainability. To start off, this week will not consist of any drastic weather climates. We will remain free of any rain or snow. 
the lows will reach about 29 degrees and the highs will get up to about 45 degrees. So don't forget to grab your winter coats when heading back to campus. Moving up in the sky and heading to the stars, let's recap on the great conjunction of December 2020. This was not any ordinary planetary configuration. The last one seen to the naked eye was in 1623. Now what exactly happened? On Monday night, December 21st, Saturn and Jupiter appeared just 0.1 degrees apart from each other. Although in actuality, they were hundreds of thousands of miles apart from each other, to our eyes on Earth, they looked like they were overlapping completely. While this was an exciting and rare occurrence, it was no giant beacon of light shining down from the sky. It basically looked like a larger star or even a motionless plane. However, it was definitely an event worth peeking your head out the window for, as it was probably the last time a configuration like this would happen in our lifetime. Now, for the last 200 years, Jupiter and Saturn have been aligning only in Earth signs. But this year, on December 21st, 2020, they shifted into the air sign of Aquarius. This great conjunction happening for the first time in 200 years represents a huge shift in the way that we live and a major gain in community-based living. It seems pretty fair after the year we've all had. Jupiter and Saturn will also be aligning at zero degrees in Aquarius, which is an extra significant degree of the zodiac. Zero represents infinite potential and holds the energy of limitless possibilities. This may be one of the reasons why you've seen such a growth in small businesses and people encouraging small businesses instead of looking to big corporations and governments for their support. Now, if you believe in signs from the sky to give you guidance, this is one you do not want to miss. Whether you've had a recently budding idea, the urge to start something new in your life, this is the time to put those ideas into fruition. To take full advantage of the alignment of these planets, you could follow these tips. First, think, what do you want to achieve? Do you have an idea for your own small business? Have you wanted to recently change your habits? Do you have an inkling right now to change your life path or your focus or your career? Focus on this goal, whatever it may be, and set your mind to it. Imagine that you have already completed it. It's already yours. Imagine what it feels like in that moment that it is finally complete. Do you feel happy? Do you feel relieved? Are you excited? Write down on paper what this complete goal looks and feels like to you. One important tip is to make sure that you write it in the present tense, as if this goal has already been completed and it's already yours. For example, one might say, it feels so great to have started my own small business and I'm so glad I get to share my creativity with others. Now with that piece of paper, you can fold it up, keep it by your nightstand, think about it, envision it, and go for it. This is the time to accomplish your goals and you do not want to miss it. Heading back down to Earth, Drexel has just released a significant statement announcing 2021 as the climate year. Recognizing the urgency of climate change, students, faculty, and professional staff from across Drexel University as well as the Academy of Natural Sciences are coming together to make 2021 our climate year. Drexel plans to celebrate and support the climate work happening at all levels of the university and campus, as well as launching new initiatives to combat climate change. On December 4th, Drexel also announced the creation of an Office of Sustainability. This includes a five-member team dedicated to focusing on Drexel's sustainability. Drexel's Office of Sustainability has been a student-run work in progress for a couple of years now, so it is definitely significant to see it gain some university-wide support. Here are some efforts that you can expect stated in Drexel's five-step goal in achieving climate change awareness and action. The first is strengthening the institutional climate commitment. The second is promoting climate and sustainability focused courses and experiential learning opportunities. The third step is inspiring climate focused research, civic engagement and collaboration. The fourth step is engaging the community through public facing climate and sustainability programming. And their fifth and final step is to take inventory coordinate and track all climate work happening at all levels of the university. Currently, Drexel is not really having the most prominent global imprint on campus due to no one really being here. However, come January, the freshman class will be returning to dorms 
and a large sum of upperclassmen will be returning as well. The real question is, will this large return to campus positively or negatively reflect Drexel's new initiative? With the current height of the pandemic as well, we are all eager to see what outcomes will result from Drexel's return to campus come 2021. Now, how will climate year impact you as a student when returning to campus? Will you see any significant changes? And how can you as a student make an impact on our campus's global imprint? Keep following Thunder Index as we take close note to the progress being made to this university-wide movement. To learn more about Drexel's Climate Year, you can visit Drexel's Climate Year website or email the Office of Sustainability at sustainability at drexel.edu. And that is all of the storms, stars, and sustainability that I have for you this week. It's always thundering in Philadelphia. Thank you for tuning in, Dragons, and I'll see you next week. Welcome to Drexel Update. My name is Emily McAndrews and today I'm interviewing Greg Drapkin, the president of 8 to the Bar. But before we start, make sure you go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure you follow us on Instagram at inside underscore ambition. Hi Greg, how are you? I'm good Emily, thanks for having me today. We're so happy to have you. Um, so 8 to the Bar, uh, big fan, they're our all male acapella group here at Drexel. Um, so why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your role and eight to the bar. Yeah, so uh, I'm a second year student at Drexel um, and this past spring I was elected president of the group. Um, in that role, I'm kind of in charge of facilitating. So I've had our e-board basically doing uh, bi-weekly meetings and then also kind of leading the group in new business and talking about, you know, our vision moving forward, especially in this ridiculous time. So the roles kind of evolved into um, you know, creating rather than just doing what we've always done. We're trying to figure out where to go from here. So, so what have you guys uh, been doing during this time? Obviously, it's a little tricky, um, you know, dealing with music over Zoom. But how have you guys been able to handle it? Yeah, it, it's actually worked out really well. We um, I'm super proud of our e-board. They worked very hard over the summer. We started meetings back in the end of spring and we kind of planned all the way through. And we've been really successful in planning basically one rehearsal a week for a little over an hour. And uh, not to get too specific into it, but we've kind of figured out a way to use Zoom as a platform to share the music, do very interesting vocal warm ups, and then kind of just learn on our own and then come back together and use our times together more as a chance to um, just interact and see each other when we would be usually rehearsing and hanging out with each other to kind of you know, play games or figure out whatever we can do to keep everyone engaged um, and looking forward to when we can be back together again. Yeah, it's definitely nice to have that little bit of connection, like a little time to get back together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you guys definitely have your own individual sound. Uh, you guys are definitely a little more like fun and that's kind of like your big thing. How do you guys usually pick your music that you do each year? Yeah, so we, we start by um, electing our music director along with the rest of our board and they are totally put in charge of figuring things out. We put out a survey to the rest of the group, ask for suggestions. Um, and actually one of our songs this year was chosen uh, through that survey. And then basically our music director goes and tries to figure out what is gonna work best for us for the rest of our goals. And in addition, how we're going to go um, into for our story, for our competitions, um, what will flow with those. Um, but in addition, we usually do senior solos at the end, and those are completely chosen by the seniors and whatever they want to do. Well, that's awesome. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit about competitions. Um, do you guys have any coming up in the near future? Yeah, so our big goal in this time of pandemic world, we've been solely putting our focus onto um, our big competition every year, which is the International uh, Championship of Collegiate Acapella. Um, which is a super exciting competition. Um, it's kind of the biggest, if you've seen Pitch Perfect, um, Pitch Perfect is based off of this competition. So it's gonna be a lot different this year instead of our normal 15 minute set. It's just about a five minute set that we're gonna be doing virtually. Um, and we just have two songs this year as opposed to three. 
Um, so it, it's been a challenge, um, but we thought that it was important to give our group members something to look forward to and something to put our energy into. We felt like if we were just kind of roaming around, you know, we can't do a concert, obviously. Um, so we thought that this gave us something very specific to put our energy into. And we're really excited about um, our progress in it and looking forward. So that's going to be in February, and we'll hopefully be sharing that video along um, when our commission goes in. That's really awesome. I'm glad that you guys were still able to like get things together during this. Um, yeah. It certainly must be certainly must be tricky, <laughs> um, for sure. A challenge for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have any personal favorites that the group has done? So yeah, this is my first year. Um, I guess I just finished my first year in the group. Um, I actually do like very easily have a favorite in mind. Um, it would still feel, um, which is, oh my gosh, I have to think of, um, I'll get the name of the band for you because um, I'm forgetting right now. <laughs> Such an awesome song. And um, our soloist Brandon Nelson was just incredible on it. And it it's just super fun. And it like, to me, gave the vibe of our group so well. Um, Telling me that I can't remember the name of the band, but I will find that. <laughs> um, but so other than the competition, what are you looking most forward to this year? Um, hopefully as things start to get better and you know, what are you guys kind of working towards? Yeah, so we have a couple of things um, that we're looking forward to. I mean, primarily this next month is going to be solely competition based. And then after that, we have big plans to hopefully put out our first EP, which is going to be super exciting. Um, but you know, it's all of these things when you're working remotely, it's just what we've been trying to like tell the rest of our group is that these things take more time. We're not together. We don't want to be, you know, in a virtual atmosphere for a vocal group. It's not like we are the most efficient in this realm, you know? So the, the story that we've kind of been preaching is, you know, it's going to take time, but let's give ourselves goals that are attainable um, and worthwhile. Because the biggest thing that like, for me in my role, it's like, I don't want to be wasting anyone's time. But give ourselves something, do the best that we can in that, and then move forward from there. So competition right now, and then looking forward to that EP is going to be super exciting. But, you know, we just want to take our time. And everyone is dealing with a million things, given the current world that we're in. So we want to be respectful of that and just do something that we're proud of and not put more pressure on anyone that isn't necessary. That's awesome. I'm really excited for you guys and everything that you guys are going to be working on. Um, so if people want to stay up to date with you guys, where can they find you? Yeah, at 8 to the bar on all of our social media. On Facebook, I think we're at 8TTB. Um, but yeah, other than that, just search 8 to the bar Drexel and you will find us. Um, yeah, I'm super grateful that we're able to keep making music during this time. And we'll all be back together and enjoy it in person hopefully soon. Awesome. Super cool. Really excited to see what you guys do this year. Uh, so Greg, thank you so much for coming today and talking with us. Thank you, Emily. Congrats to everyone at Inside Ambition for you guys. Are doing. Thank you. And best of luck. Have a good one. All right. Thanks for watching Drexel Update. Uh, make sure you guys go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, follow us on Instagram at inside underscore ambition. And of course, you can find 8 to the Bar on all of their social media at 8 to the Bar. We'll see you guys next week. Hey friends, welcome back to Inside Ambition, and thank you for tuning in to the first episode of The Main Report, the weekly Drexel and Philly News Rewind so that you don't get left behind. I'm Gabby Remo, and whew, baby, do we have a first show for you. So, Gabby, what are we going to talk about today? Thank you, Gabby. Today, we will be recapping the national news of 2020. We have to, especially when talking about the biggest event of 2020, the coronavirus. I mean, it's physically impossible to talk about 2020 without talking about the global impact of COVID-19. It dominated the year, taking the lives of millions of people and has become another source of political division in America. I mean, who knew we can make a virus political too? What next? A debate on universal access to the basic human right of healthcare? So glad that's not happening, right? Right, Gabby? Hello? Are you still there? 
And while I'm alone to my thoughts and before it overtakes me, let's jump right into the timeline. And we're gonna start right from what we know as the beginning. On December 31st, 2019, while everyone and their moms was standing side by side in what is now cringeworthy close contact in New York City, sharing sweat and swapping spit under the big old shiny ball waiting for its drop, the real ball was dropped when the Wuhan Municipal Health Commission reported their first cluster of cases of pneumonia in Wuhan. At this point, there was no evidence supporting that notion that this unknown virus was spread by humans. No deaths were reported until January 11, when Chinese state media declared the first death linked to the coronavirus. Until then, there was no confirmed cases elsewhere. And that was the world's first glimpse of the violence that is COVID-19. And on January 20th, multiple countries confirmed cases outside of mainland China. This included Japan, Thailand, and South Korea. And back here in the United States, the first confirmed case occurred in Washington. There, a man developed symptoms after returning from a business trip to Wuhan, China. Within three days of this, the Chinese government closed Wuhan and restricted travel to and from the city. At this point in time, almost 20 deaths were reported. The World Health Organization convened an emergency committee under the International Health Regulations, IHR 2005, to assess whether to declare this outbreak a public health emergency of global concern. Thousands of new cases were reported in China and across the world by January 30th. Thus, the World Health Organization declared this a global health emergency. Because of this, on January 31st, the Trump administration announced the first in a wave of travel bans. He blocked travel into the United States by any foreign nationals who had traveled to China within two weeks. This garnered immediate criticism, some even citing this act as xenophobic. On February 27th, due to concerns over the new approaching pandemic, stocks began to tank. This would begin a rapid decline that resulted in March 9th, Black Monday, being the largest stock market drop since the Great Depression. Who knew we were all about to learn exactly why it was called the Great Depression the first time around? Throughout the month of February, new cases and sadly, new deaths were announced daily across the world. Italy and Iran became global epicenters of the virus and were deeply affected as they experienced saturated outbreaks in their nations. Into March, COVID-19 began to raise heck in the United States. With 130 reported cases and 11 recorded deaths, this was the beginning of a violent, upward slant in cases that would horrify the world over. March 5th saw the US pass the first COVID relief bill, the only one that the government seemed to coordinate on before falling into complete disarray. Somehow, I've been paying twice the bills Congress has been passing on less than half of their salary. But I digress. March 11th was the day that the world began to end with the WHO officially naming the COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic. It is also the day that Trump instituted another travel ban, this time to most of Western and Central Europe. So I guess we can't see London, can't see France, at least for the time being anyways. March 12th gave us the beginning of shutdowns with New York instituting the first lockdown procedure. Only one day later, March 13th, Trump officially issued a state of emergency regarding the pandemic leading to great panic buying and tremendous memes about Karens fighting for toilet paper in aisle six. And on March 14th, all Drexel students were forced to move online and all those in student housing were evicted, giving a matter of days to move out. Our community was scrambling to find shelter in the midst of a public health emergency. And by March 17th, Every state in the U.S. was touched by COVID-19, and by March 19th, over 280,000 people filed for unemployment. March 21st saw the FDA officially grant nationwide approval for initial rapid testing procedures, which would detect the virus in 45 minutes, thus making it the fastest virus locator since my grandma's home computer. The following day, the first U.S. Senator, Rand Paul, tested positive for the virus, and this terrified U.S. citizens and, for some, legitimized this virus. 
At this point in March, the United States led the world in confirmed cases. By March 26th, the U.S. had 81,321 confirmed infections and more than 1,000 deaths. This was more reported than in any country at that point in time. This also continued to devastate our economy, which led to President Trump signing a $2 trillion stimulus package to help the economy. Our cases and deaths continued to climb, wrapping up the month of March at around 163,000 infected and over 3,000 dead. Because of this, the CDC began advising people to take safety precautions to slow the spread and stay at home orders extended for months, which sparked outrage, many businesses protests, some hitting national newsstands very close to home. For example, the protest by the Atlas Gym in Belmar, New Jersey, less than 20 minutes outside of Philadelphia. The gym refused to close down during the state's mandated shutdown, and since then have accrued $124,000 in fines. The owners both claim this is just the big bad government taking over control in disguise of a public health crisis, and not a single case of COVID-19 has been linked to their establishment. The anti-lockdown train really started in April of 2020, when United States citizens began protesting the mandated lockdown. These protests were organized predominantly by conservative groups and individuals. The arguments centered around the economic and social impact of stay-at-home orders, business closures, and restriction of personal freedoms. And objectively, they weren't wrong. By April of 2020, 10 million people were out of work, which led to 6.6 .6 million people applying for unemployment. Prior to this, the worst week for unemployment filings was 695,000 in 1982. We were entering a deep economic recession, and at the rate that we were at, economists envisioned a long-term depression. So, that makes two depressions I was struggling with. Heyo! <laughs> The medical community struggled in the beginning of this pandemic, specifically due to a lack of resources. Those battling COVID-19 on the front lines were scrambling to find personal protection equipment, better known as PPE. By April, Drexel heard this call and sprung to action. Our university aided the call by turning their Department of Material Science and the power of 3D printing to produce face shields for several hospitals. We love to see it. On April 14th, Trump decided the world was better off without our help and pulled U.S. funding from the WHO for not sending more aid and resources to the U.S. Does it sound ironic? I'll let you decide. To wrap up April, Trump signed a bill to help small businesses with all the funds immediately going to businesses that weren't small. And Texas and Florida reopened prematurely, to no one's surprise. The global death toll surpassed 200,000, and more than 2.8 million people worldwide were infected. Countries around the world were entering into recessions, but most leaders felt torn and hopeless. How do you both save your country from economic downfall whilst also maintaining their public health? It was all about prioritization. And by May, Americans were really down. Between February and May, more than 5 million Americans lost health insurance coverage and over 23 million filed for unemployment. Through the preceding months, the coronavirus ripped through regions, both new and old. In June of 2020, regions like Africa and Latin America, previously not harshly impacted, became victims to this pandemic. Closing up June, Florida and South Carolina broke their single-day records for new cases. Southern states experienced infection levels so high where lockdown, social distancing, and mask restrictions were much less strict. And by July, the United States reported almost 2 million positive cases. The previous monthly high occurred in April, with less than half of the cases being recorded. Florida fulfilled its national duty of being the most nutty state in the U.S., becoming the new viral epicenter and topping 10,000 cases a day. On August 16th, the CDC began a development plan for the COVID-19 vaccine. 
they began consulting with large states and cities, one being our home, Philadelphia, to develop plans to distribute that vaccine. The agency chose communities like ours for a pilot program, which is essentially a small scale experimental trail in the short term that helps the CDC learn how the project may do on a larger scale. In this case, the vaccine and getting it out there. Simultaneously, universities were coming back and some were even attending in-person classes. This was quickly shut down. The University of Notre Dame announced that it would be moving to online instruction for at least two weeks in an attempt to slow the spread as colleges across the nation experienced outbreaks. Temple University experienced a campus shutdown in August. By mid-September, the United States surpassed 200,000 deaths linked to the coronavirus, a figure commonly referenced through the presidential election. And then, it happened. Twitter, Instagram, and fake news Facebook really blew up when this story broke. On October 2nd, President Trump tested positive for the virus. This further sent the political world into a frenzy, as prior to his positive test, he was in attendance at the infamous presidential debate. By the end of October, the US was topping over 100,000 new cases every single day. By November, the US surpassed 10 million infections, and 10 days later, the US death toll hit 250,000. In early December, deliberation over a second relief bill begun, and most resolutions were not fully reached until a few days into the new year. And then, what felt like long lost hope emerged from the shadows. On December 11th, the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine was issued emergency authorization by the FDA, opening the gate for its distribution in the US. Seven days later, a second vaccine by Moderna received the same authorization, though in contrast, it's only for individuals 18 years or older. On December 14th, one of the first vaccines was administered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia soon followed. For some, but not all of us, the distribution of a vaccine finally feels like we are rounding the corner on this horrible disease. And plus, Great initiatives have been announced recently, so close to home. On December 15th, Drexel revealed that they are partnering with SEPTA to effectively decrease the spread of the virus on public transportation. This initiative encapsulates more than $600,000 in federal funding in order to develop a new air and surface cleaning technology to improve the safety of riders and employees. Go Dragons! It was a hopeful way to close out 2020 in our community. And now we're here, January 2021. We didn't know. In my spirit, I did not know how we were going to make it to 2021, which in reality is a huge blessing. Given the strength of this virus, I'm glad you and I could share these moments together. But the pandemic is far from over. I wanna make that very clear. But if we all just try to do what we can to protect ourselves and others, we can soldier through to a better 2021. As in the unforgettable quote from High School Musical goes, we are all in this together. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of The Main Report. We hope to see you again soon. For as long as there's news that you will need, I, Gabby Remo, will be there to report it. I'll see you next week.